There will now be an opportunity for silent prayer and meditation. Thanks. Please be seated. Can we please switch the cell phones off? The only item on today's order paper is questions addressed to the president. Uh, just to remind members that you may press the talk button on your desks if you wish to ask a supplementary question. I wish to remind honorable members that the names of members requesting supplementary questions will be cleared as soon as the honorable the president starts answering the fourth supplementary question. The first question has been asked by the Honorable L.S. Makubela Mashele. The Honorable, the President is invited to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Deputy President, members, the economy achieved GDP growth of 3.1% in the fourth quarter of 2017. Our currency has strengthened and uh, we can see that investor confidence has improved quite significantly. It is therefore critical that we mobilize all social partners to unite behind a common program of economic recovery and transformation. And we can take a leaf from how a number of other economies around the world have had to address their own economic woes. Countries such as Ireland, Netherlands, South Korea and Sweden have in the past successfully forged what one can call social compacts to drive economic growth. It is imperative that in our own situation that government, labor, business and civil society also agree on a set of fundamental actions and work in concert to implement a social compact. At the same time, each of these social partners do actually need to commit themselves to specific undertakings. There are a number of areas where agreement has been reached and firm commitments have been made. Government, for example, has committed itself to ensure policy certainty and consistency. It has also committed itself to strengthen the capabilities of the state. Government has also committed itself to end corruption and wastage and to sustain investment in economic and social infrastructure. We are working to create what I would call an enabling environment for business to invest, for business to thrive, and indeed to create jobs and reduce inequality in our country. As part of the contribution, business should also undertake to invest more to create more job opportunities and implement measures to, to reduce income inequality, improve the working conditions of working people in their firms, and to invest in skills and also to develop innovation. Labor should work with employers to strengthen collective bargaining to reduce labor instability and support measures to improve productivity all round. We look to civil society
to mobilize South Africans from all quarters to participate also in the economic recovery that our country so yearns for. South Africa has demonstrated at critical moments in our history the value of cooperation among social partners to tackle what people would have called intractable problems. This we have demonstrated, and some people even begin to suggest that it is within our DNA as a nation to be able to work together to resolve problems and to tackle what many around the world would have regarded as intractable problems. The one that we did to good effect, even though we still have to complete the task, was to end apartheid. Apartheid was regarded by many in the world as an intractable problem. And in fact, when they looked at our country, they thought that South Africa would just descend into a racial war which would consume as many people in the country as they could imagine. We came together also after the advent of democracy to craft a new labor relations framework to assert the rights of workers and usher in a new era of cooperation and stability. Following the global financial crisis of 2008, government, labor, as well as business <clears throat> effectively worked together to ensure South Africa was spared the worst effects of the 2008 crisis. All this happened because we put into effect our DNA and we managed to get everyone to work together. These partners came together again in early 2016 to respond to downgrades from rating agencies and decline in investor confidence in our country to establish the CEO initiative, which has done much to promote investment, support small businesses, and also to tackle youth unemployment. Most recently, we've also, through the process of so social compacting, we've worked together to introduce a national minimum wage as part of our effort to reduce income inequality. Later this month, we will launch the Youth Employment Service, which we referred to in the State of the Nation Address, and which promises to significantly improve the absorption of young people into the workplace. Over the course of the next few months, we will be engaging social partners in preparation for the National Jobs Summit. The summit, which is being looked forward to by many sectors in our country, will agree on a series of practical measures that will create jobs, particularly amongst young people. The outcomes of that summit will form an important part of the broader social compact that we are striving to build. It will be supported by cooperation in other areas such as in the deliberations which we are having right now, which the Minister of Mineral Resources is leading on the mining charter, consultations on land reform, preparations for the social sector summit engagement in NEDLEC on comprehensive social security and other matters, and also on the ongoing work of the CEO initiative. There is much that we do need to do to achieve a sustained and durable economic recovery in our country, working together and bound by a commitment of, uh, and a common vision of a just and prosperous society, I am certain that we will be able to succeed. And all these things are part of the social compacting process that is underway. And some of these we may not see immediately, but social compacting is taking place on an ongoing basis as many South Africans get together to discuss matters of great interest to them and some of those matters may even be those that we think 
have no solution. But they work together and they do find solutions. This is the great lesson that we were taught by the father of our nation, Nelson Mandela, who took the initiative to initiate social compacting that has led to the democracy that we enjoy today. And in this year of Nelson Mandela, may we firmly follow in his footsteps and continue to build social compacts that will make life a lot easier for all our people. Thank you very much. The Honorable Makubela Mashile. Uh, afternoon, Honorable President. I think you would agree with me that all social partners are critical to drive the economic recovery of the country. And I want to know that how will government, through the NEDLEC process, at the, NED, at the, at the NEDLEC level, ensure that all social partners who are critical to drive the economic recovery and pursue a common vision for the country, ensure that there isn't any unnecessary conflicts among social partners. If you are to give confidence to the nation today, what are you going to be doing as the main driver of all of coordinating and ensuring that, that all these social partners play ball and they drive the economic recovery of the country? Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable the President. Thank you, Madam Speaker. One of the greatest inventions that we've really come up with in South Africa is an institution like NEDLEC. I have heard a number of people outside our country uh, wanting to know more details about how NEDLEC works uh, because they see it as an institution which promotes social compacting, promotes dialogue, collaboration, and the reaching of agreement, and indeed, solving of problems. Now, many of us may not know that there are many people from around the world who keep thronging to the doors of NEDLEC, who keep coming to our country to find out how we've been able to keep an institution like NEDLEC to one, be sustainable, to be as effective as it is. And this was also commented on by a very senior judge in the United States who said, if you really want to know how democracy should work, go to South Africa, go and look at their constitution, but more importantly, go and look at some of the institutions they have put in place to resolve social problems. Now, NEDLEC is one of those. We have been able to utilize NEDLEC not only to process key legislation that should come here to Parliament for, for passing, but also to tackle and address important problems. One that is before NEDLEC now is the comprehensive social security agreement that community members, trade unions, and indeed business would like to see us resolving. Now, the architecture of NEDLEC is such that it brings together all those partners who know that they have to be part of the process because if they are not part of the NEDLEC process, then they miss out, then they misrepresent their own constituencies. We are able to keep them together to answer your question more directly. We are able to keep them together because they find that through the dialogue that takes place in NEDLEC, it's both, it's both very cooperative, two, very informative, three, very educative, if one can use that word, and most effective in terms of reaching an agreement. So if you really want to reach an agreement on a very difficult problem that affects the nation, go to NEDLEC. That, that is where you will find solutions because the participants at NEDLEC who represent the South African society I have often found are committed to resolving problems away from sloganeering, away from the noise, away from uh, taking public positions. They are able to sit down and resolve the problems. And that is the magic of NEDLEC. And long may it last that we all, as South Africans, continue to use NEDLEC 
as a platform, as a forum where we resolve problems on a continuous basis. Thank you very much. The Honorable Shibambu. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. So, President, you're speaking about renewal and uh, different of, of things, but I think the more you speak, the more confusing you become because first, in your state of national address, you didn't mention the NDP. When you responded, you spoke about the NDP as your plan. But the 51st National Congress ideological underpinning of land expropriation not compensation, nationalization of the Reserve Bank, creation of a sovereign wealth fund and a variety of what could be a radical shift of what the ANC has been doing doesn't appear in the NDP. So like altogether your 54th National Conference uh, uh, fundamentally changes what the NDP stands for. Why do you want to insist that you are, you are being guided by the National Development Plan, which is radically different and contradictory in many instances to what your conference has resolved. What do you stand for? <laughs> the Honorable the President. Uh, Honorable uh, Speaker, Honorable Shibambo, what we really stand for is what uh, will advance the interests of South Africans. That's what we stand for. Uh, now you you talk and you, you talk uh, you you talk about the NDP. The NDP is the policy that we have adopted as this parliament. I just want you to remind you there. You are a member of parliament. We are all members of parliament. This parliament adopted the NDP. <laughs> I'm sorry you were not there. But as, yeah, I'm sorry you were not there, but as it is, uh, there's a concept called democratic centralism. You are also bound by the decisions that were taken by this house. So, so the, 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 this house and indeed the governing party having adopted the national development plan also said the national development plan is a living document. It's not a static document. It is a living document that we need to look at consistently and continuously to see what we can take out of the NDP in order to improve the lives of our people. You will know, as you are also on the left, that there are quite a number of uh, institutions or structures that are on the left that have raised concerns about the economic chapter of the NDP. They being, yes, they being COSATU and they being the South African Communist Party. And we have said that we are willing, prepared and able to look at that chapter. And I'd like to invite you, Honorable Shubambu, to join the process of looking at that chapter of the NDP to see how best it can be improved. And you seem to be a person who is full of ideas and uh, so you are therefore invited that you can do so. But what really guides us is how we improve the lives of our people without adhering to slogans, without pontificating, and without just addressing ourselves to the gallery. We are more interested in saying, this is how you advance the interests of South Africans, yes, when it comes to land, which I will address in a minute, the National Development Plan does not address the land question in the way that this parliament has now taken a resolution to push the land question for forward. And we must say that is where the NDP becomes a living document, becomes a living document because it is there to be improved, to be sharpened, and to be used as an instrument that can improve the lives of our people. And I hope that, that you, you will find that satisfactory because if you were thinking that the NDP is a static document, the answer is no. And maybe in your own time, you will find uh, that you, your own party will be able to adopt the NDP as well. Thank you very much. The Honorable Olomisa. 
Madam Speaker, Mr. President, given the emergency of new players in the labor movement terrain, such as SAFSU, as well as the need to always improve the relations within the socio-economic forum, is it not time that you consider to reconfigure the structure of NETLEC in the interest of building cohesion and enhancing industrial relations. Thank you. The Honorable the President. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Honorable Holomisa. Uh, I'm made to believe that there are discussions that are taking place within the labor component of NEDLEC, and I've taken the view that those who are part of that labor component should engage in discussions and deliberations themselves without any influence or interference from any other quarter, including government, so that they reach an accord, an understanding, an agreement, which will deal with the architecture of uh, that labor component that represents labor. As it is now, we've got three federations that represent labor and that labor component, and uh, those discussions that they may well be having with SAFTU could lead to something. It also has to do with the representativity of each labor organization in order for it to finally qualify to be representative of uh, working people in our country. Once an agreement is reached, we as government will be willing and prepared to work with whoever uh, they put forward as a labor component. As it is now, we work well with communities because they have structured themselves in a way that lend uh, that component to being able to participate on a representative basis. And similarly, with business. They too went through a process of having to have dialogue amongst themselves to finally agree on how they participate in NETLEC. Thank you very much. The Honorable Mayor. Speaker, the, the President has promised a social compact that would result in hope and renewal. But since being elected, he seems to have become infected with the political equivalent of a Novichok nerve agent because he seems paralyzed and unable to act decisively and has actually delivered a cabinet with a number of useless ministers, a cabinet that cannot be bothered to show up and be accountable, land expropriation without compensation, and the nationalization of the Reserve Bank. So will he tell us whether he is paralyzed and unable to act decisively? Because although he is in office, the most dangerous man in politics, the Honorable Deputy President David Mabuza, is actually in power. The Honorable the President. Honorable Speaker, I just don't know what I need to show Honorable Mania uh, that I am not paralyzed. Do you want to see his arm? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Um, Honorable Speaker, quite frankly, that question does not even uh, deserve an answer. And the only answer I can give him, he having possibly wasted a great opportunity of asking a meaningful question, is to say, I am not paralyzed. Thank you very much. We now come to question number two from the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Maimane. Madam Speaker, thank you. Land is central to human existence. Land is about dignity. Land is an asset that supports life. For millennia, it has supported life, enabled the creation and the development of societies and made economic activity possible. It is fundamental to the dignity 
and well-being of all our people. The dispossession of land of the indigenous people of this country is therefore what I characterize as the original sin that continues to constrain the realization of the potential of our people. The return of land to those who work it is fundamental to the transformation of our society, and it is critical if we are to improve the lives of the poor people in our country. In this, the year of Nelson Mandela, we need to work together to ensure that his vision for land reform is realized. This parliament and government should therefore be committed to the implementation of a comprehensive land reform program that corrects the historical injustices of land dispossession, provides land to the poor in both rural and urban areas, and strengthens the property rights of all South Africans, and increases agricultural production, and also, more importantly, improves and secures food security. Since 1994, the democratic government has embarked on a number of interventions to advance land reform, including restitution, redistribution, and tenure reform. While more than three million hectares of land was restored between 1995 and 2014, the land audit report indicates that the white people in our country still own around 72% of the farms owned by individuals. Colored people in our country own 15%, and Indians 5%, and Africans who constitute the majority of the people who live in this beautiful land only own 4%. It was also reported that males own 72% and female only 13%. We must, given all this, and given the history that we have had, we must therefore work with urgency to significantly and sustainably accelerate the pace of land reform. Because if we do not do so, this problem that has stayed with us as a nation for hundreds of years, when the dispossession of land started in this country and reached its zenith point in 1912 when the ANC was formed, primarily to fight against land dispossession will implode in our hands. This is the historic task that we have as South Africans to address this question once and for all. The expropriation of land without compensation is one of the mechanisms that government will use to achieve land reform and land redistribution. As I indicated in the State of the Nation Address, government will undertake a process of broad consultation to determine the modalities of the implementation of this mechanism. Following this announcement, the National Assembly passed a groundbreaking resolution on this matter, opening up an opportunity for all South Africans to participate in this critical debate. And this resolution, so we all remember, followed in the wake and in the footsteps of the resolution that was adopted by the 54th Conference of the Governing Party. It was the Governing Party that once again saw that we do need to speed up the process of land reform in our country.
Now, this matter has been firmly placed on the national agenda, and we applaud those who have come forward with views and proposals. This process of engagement presents a great opportunity for a new reinvigorated rather drive for meaningful and sustainable land reform. This, Madam Speaker, is an opportunity to assert the transformational intent of our Constitution. Our Constitution is a transformational document. It is a document that prescribes how we can transform our country and how we can heal the wounds of the past. It is an opportunity to recognize that the property clause in the Bill of Rights is a mandate for radical transformation. The property clause was never constructed for the purpose of retaining existing property relations in our country. When the property clause was conceptualized, it was conceptualized with the view of saying, we need to change property relations in our country. It is a transformative instrument constructed to facilitate transfer of land and property to South Africans who had been deprived of land through colonial and apartheid policies. Now, the property clause in the Constitution specifically requires that the state should take reasonable legislative and other measures to enable the citizens of our country to gain access to land on an equitable basis. It also requires that the state should take steps to guarantee security of tenure and restitution of land to those affected by apartheid dispossession. There is a strong case, therefore, to be made that the use of expropriation without compensation in certain circumstances to advance land reform is entirely consistent with the provisions of our Constitution. It is our collective responsibility to use these provisions in our Constitution more effectively and more directly to drive land reform. We should not reduce the enormous task of land reform to a debate on expropriation without compensation. During this process of consultation and engagement, we must review the full extent of our land reform program since 1994. We must also review the real content and full meaning of our Constitution, identifying where there have been shortcomings and undertaking measures to strengthen policies and programs. One of the areas where we must acknowledge a lack of progress is with respect to processing of claims by labor tenants. We therefore must take seriously the responsibility given to government by the Supreme Court of Appeal to urgently develop a program to process outstanding claims. It is clear that we must strengthen the institutions that have been tasked with effecting land reform, ensuring that they have the capacity and resources to meet the needs of the poor. Nor should we limit ourselves to agricultural land. We should take steps to address the property rights of people living in informal settlements and in the inner city buildings that have absentee landlords. We need to develop a clear strategy, a very clear strategy to dispose of under, unutilized public, publicly owned land for inclusive urban development to bring poor people from the periphery into the center of the cities. Now, one is not often uh, very 
impressed by what DA mayors do from time to time. But here is what a DA mayor said and did the other day. He said, and this is uh, Herman Mashaba, he said, we will expropriate buildings and in this bid, we will expand affordable accommodation. We will be willing to expropriate inner city Johannesburg buildings where he could not locate the owner, he said, or a fair selling price could not be negotiated. He would expropriate such buildings without compensation. Now, this, this colleagues begins to tell you, this begins to tell you that the resolution that was adopted here is actually a very correct resolution. And it is critical that we make this an inclusive process. We make it an inclusive process in which all South Africans are actively involved in finding just and equitable, lasting solutions. That is what we need to be doing. Now, I was most impressed, Madam Speaker, by an approach by someone who is 47 years old, who is called Mr. Codrington. He has advised white South Africans against feelings of panic about these developments, pointing out that a careful reading of the motion that was passed here on the 27th of February, amongst many other things, acknowledges that the African majority was only confined to 13% of the land, while whites owned 87% of the land that the recent land audit he continues, claims that black people own less than 2%, he argues, and less than 7% of urban land, and expropriation would be implemented, he says, in a manner that increases agricultural production, improves food security, and ensures that the land is returned to those from whom it was taken under colonialism and apartheid. And he goes on to say and undertake a process of consultation, so the resolution said, and Con Codrington then advises his white South African friends. I repeat, Codrington then advises his white South African friends that this would not be the first time the South African government has taken land without paying for it. In fact, he argues, it is at least the 15th time that the government of South Africa has passed laws. Please, and he says, please do us a favor. If your ancestors did not comment about the previous 15 times the government took land. And I am guessing that, like mine, they did not. Then right now would be a good time to be quiet and, and for a bit to listen. And he says, not forever, just for a bit. Do listen for a bit and then calmly contribute to the conversation over the next few weeks and months in an attempt to find a solution that helps everyone. And he then goes on to list all the laws. Now, this process that we are in, Honorable Maimani, because Mr. Codrington is also addressing himself to you, who has asked this question. And he says, it would be good for all of us to pause a little and listen a bit. It requires responsibility 
and the majority of all leaders, we should not pretend that there is anything revolutionary in encouraging our people to illegally occupy land, nor should we resort to the kind of swart khefar electioneering that some parties have resorted to. Let us engage in this debate as a nation. I invite all those who are angry, all those who are anxious, all those who are uncertain, and some who are excited, and those who are inspired to be part of a finding of a solution on this issue. Throughout the process, we need to work together, guided by the needs of the poor in our country, the poor who are landless, we should be guided by the understanding that our Constitution, instead of being an impediment to transformation, explicitly demands of us that we take decisive measures to redress the injustices of the past that were given rise to by dispossession. And this is also a time when we do need to sit back and listen to the stories, the heart-wrenching stories of many South Africans whose land and assets were dispossessed from them, and ask ourselves, particularly us who have land, particularly us who have assets, what would we have them do? Because right now, they have nothing. This parliament is called upon Yes, to come up with solutions. As we speak now, this parliament has an opportunity to deal with this matter through the resolution that we have passed by establishing the Constitutional Review Committee and also having dialogue or consultations throughout the country. Just yesterday, a court dealing with the issue of labor tenancy resolved that this matter would best be resolved through negotiations and sent the litigants back to go and negotiate. From a government point of view, we are saying the governing party, having come up with this resolution, it is now time for all of us to sit back and begin the process of seeing how best this resolution that the governing party resolved on at their conference can be put to effect. I have initiated a process where we will have a dialogue with a number of people and experts, both constitutional cons experts on the land issue, to begin the process of discussing this matter with a view of coming up with solutions that are going to give credence to what we resolved here on how we can use land as an opportunity to grow our economy and how we can use this opportunity to increase food production in our country. So I invite all South Africans, rather than be scared, hide your head in the sand, run away, scream and say there's a swart khafar coming, land is going to be taken, and title deeds are in danger, I say, Come to the party, let us discuss this matter and find solutions. This is the time for everyone to stop pontificating and come forward with solutions. Thank you very much. The Honorable, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I really look forward to many more of these sessions and engagements. Mr. President, I agree with you. Mm. There is a deep injustice in South Africa as far as land ownership and safety amongst black South Africans. Mm. The pace has been profoundly slow. And I think former President Kalema Motante in his high level panel review agrees. But he cites the fact that the problem is not the constitution. The problem is corruption and incapable state a lack of budget, and your government. What President Kaluma Mutante and Dikhang Museneke agree 
is that amending the constitution is not where we ought to start. And that's why Herman Mashaba must test the clauses in that constitution to show he can deliver. You, Mr. President, are a recent convert to expropriation without compensation. And you've proceeded now to say, against international experience, that in fact you can expropriate without compensation. It's clear, countries that have done that, investment goes down, unemployment goes up, life expectancy suffers, and it harms the very poor people we are describing. So here's my question to you, Mr. President. How do you reconcile your newfound view with this view that you can either have expropriation without compensation or, in fact, a growing economy that empowers citizens to own property in their rights? You can't have both. Tell us, please. The Honorable the President. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. It's quite clear that the Honorable Maimani is not listening. He clearly is not listening. And I don't know whether he's short of hearing. He is so close to where I am. And maybe I should go and whisper to him. Then he will hear better. Now, clearly, clearly, what we are talking about is not within the great understanding that he has. Because what we are saying is what the governing party resolved on. And it says, let me repeat, that in order to advance land reform in our country, we should embark on a number of mechanisms and the taking of land without compensation is one of those mechanisms that we are going to want to use. Now, the process of doing so, clearly, the, the governing party has said we want to have a broad discussion. A broad discussion, yes, we should also look at whether we should amend the Constitution or not. And that is why this House said we should set up the Constitutional Review Committee, and through that re Constitutional Review Committee, we should determine whether to put, to give effect to this resolution, yes, a constitutional amendment needs to take place or not. But at the same time, that resolution says, we are going to make sure that as we implement this resolution, we become very clear on how we are not going to damage our economy and how we are not going to damage food production in our economy and food security. Now, with that in place, we should be able to make a great deal of progress. Now, Honorable Maimani, I've been having a number of discussions with a number of people some of them who are property owners, who have said, Mr. President, we think that land is a huge problem in our country, and we are prepared to join you in resolving this problem. A number of farmers have said, yes, we are, what this calls for is that we should give access to South Africans who do not have land. South Africans who want to work the land, but find that they do not have the land. And a couple of them have come forward to say, I have inherited a lot of land, and I have found that quite a lot of it lies fallow. I do not use it. I have bought a lot of land, and I find that I do not use all this land. The land is lying fallow, some of the farmers have said, and what we want to do, they have said to me, is to find ways, and they say, give us a way through which we will be able to assist you as government to give access to people who do not have land so that they can work the land. And I have found this to be really welcome. So welcome, 
that it begins to depart from the noise that one is hearing on the left, because these are people who are not listening. We've got a lot of South Africans who are listening and saying, we need to listen to the heartbeat of South Africans. The heartbeat of South Africans tells us that there is land hunger, and this land hunger will continue if we do not address it. And we, as people who are propertied, who have land, are prepared to share so that all of us can benefit. Now, that begins to open an avenue, an avenue that we can all exploit, where people can sit down and begin to talk to good effect about the solutions that we need to find. Now, for as long as we're going to get protests, which are empty protests, really, where there is no substantive proposal being put on the table, we will not be able to make progress. I would rather go and sit down with those African-speaking farmers who are coming forward and saying, who can ons help? Ons will help, want South Africa is one country for all of us. We must hold hands and find solutions. Those are the people that we are going to be having dialogue with and talking about issues of the land, issues of growing our economy, issues of securing food security in our country. Now, we are going to be engaged with such discussions and we are going to come back here and say we have found the solutions because this is part of the mechanisms that we say should be utilized to address the issue of land and the injustice that was descended on our people hundreds of years ago. And we say, let's move forward and have that engagement. Thank you very much. The Honorable Njaisa. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Mr. President, perhaps the people may not be patient enough to wait for the scientific system to be implemented in order to deal with the issue of land. I just want to check what plans perhaps have you got to deal with the violent activities regarding road grab, the land grabbing, the grabs. It has, it, it has just, well, it has just been witnessed now on TV that some people have already started. So I just want to check now the plans that you have to care about to prevent this from happening. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The Honorable the President. We have said very clearly that the opportunity we have is to deal with the land question in a responsible manner, in a manner where we have good dialogues amongst us. And this does not open the opportunity for people to resort to self-help measures where they will go and invade land and smash and grab land. That will not be allowed. That will be stopped. That is against the tenets of our Constitution, which talks to the rule of law. We cannot have a situation where we allow land grabs, because that is anarchy. We cannot have a situation of anarchy when we have proper constitutional means through which we can work uh, to uh, give access to our people, uh, land to our people, we have proper legal measures that we can utilize. So I can say now that we will not allow land grabs, we will not allow land invasions, and those who are tempted to resort to such activities must be warned in advance that we will not allow it because it is illegal, but apart from being illegal, it begins to violate the rights of other South African citizens. And we will not allow the rights of others to be violated. Thank you very much. The Honorable Grunewald. Speaker. Ik wil beginnen om voor die achtbare president te sê, 
u zal een beredeneerde argument oor grondhervorming kry, als die uitgangspunt aanvaar wordt, dat bestaande wit eienaars van grond, die grond op een rechtmatige, op een eerlijke en op een hardwerkende manier verkry het. Hulle werk hard om Zuid-Afrika te voed. Dit moet die uitgangspunt wees. Verder wil ik voor die achtbare president sê, onteiening zonder vergoeding gaan nie die grondhervormingsprobleem oplos nie. Die voormalige minister, meneer Nkwinti, het in hierdie huis erkend dat 93% van begunstigdes in termen van restitutie wou nie die grond gehad het nie. Hulle wou die geld gehad het. Die eie minister het erkend in hierdie huis dat die staat het 99% van grond wat een grondhervormingsprogramma verkry is, die titelaktes bekom. Nou is my vraag aan u, achtbare president. Denk u nie, as u een succes van grondhervorming wil maak, dat u meer as 4000 plaas wat thans in besit van die regering is, dat dit eers verdeel word en aan mense gegee word, en dan wil ik laatstens vir u sê, ek stem saam, rechte moet beskerm word. Maar achtbare president, op grondvlak, als een grondeienaar zo grond bezet wordt onwettig en hij schakel die politiestatie, dan sê die politie ons kan niks doen nie. Dit moet onmiddellijk rechtgestel word. Jy kan niet verwachten dat de persoon eerst bij die hof, een aanzoek moet krijgen die Honorable politie member, moet dadelijk optreden. Is one minute over, honourable president. Thank you very much, uh, honourable Grunewald. Uh, ik stem saam dat ons moet, wat al die dingen wat ons gaan doen, ons moet ook kijken naar die land wat nu op hier die oomblik in die staatse boek zit. Because we have a lot of land. Now, you know, one needs to look at this. We've got categories of land in our country. And we've got a number of farms that are owned. Yes, lots of land that's owned by the state. And we are saying part of the interventions that we should embark upon should be to address the land that is owned by the state. And that land, to the extent that it is possible, should be parceled out and given to our people. That should be done. And there's quite a lot of land that is owned also by our state-owned enterprises, by our various government departments, as well as local governments. Now, where there is a need and a hunger for land, we are saying one of the interventions should be that land should be made a priority for distribution to our people. I agree with you completely. When it comes to things like land grabs, yes, I hear you. We will not be allowing police just to stand by when land grabs are taking place. The police's job is to uphold the law, and when reports of land grabs happen, the police must immediately ensure that those who are perpetrating those acts are arrested. That's what should start happening. Now, we are serious about the issue of land, and we will be looking, Mr. Krunewald or Honorable Krunewald, to all those categories of land. And this is by no means the only category. The other category, of course, is land that, is dis that, that lies fallow without any owners taking account of it or being accountable for it. Land that lies fallow, that is disused, that has absentee landlords, that's also land that is going to be looked at. Herman Mashaba is looking at buildings and he wants to take them without compensation. And in the course of all that, he's also going to take some buildings that may well also have owners who owe the municipalities monies and what have you. Now, there are various mechanisms that can be utilized to address the issue of land. And let me say that one size does not fit all when it comes to land. We need to look at a variety of methods 
And that is why the call for dialogue, for discussion, becomes relevant. Because it is when we are able to sit down and talk about this and hear the experiences of poor people, but at the same time, hear the offers of people who have land, who say that in response to the poverty that we see, we are prepared to even give land to those who want to work the land. So as South Africans, we are going to be coming up with a number of interesting proposals, Honorable Grunewald, and that is why I say we should not be too angry, too scared, too anxious to get into this debate. Just like when we approach democracy in our country, many people were so fearful, many people were so anxious, others started packing into their, their pantries tins and tins of food for, for months and months. And we are saying this is not the time to do so. This is the time to talk. This is the time to find solutions. This is the time when we as South Africans must collaborate with a view of coming up with solutions. And solutions we will find. Thank you very much. The Honorable Lekota. Madam Speaker, may I ask for your protection, please? I have a right. You are totally protected, Honorable Thank you very much. Yeah. Honorable President, I am, uh, I, I am very, very disturbed that suddenly, suddenly, we are no longer all South Africans. Some of us are Indians, others are colored, others are white. The Constitution, no, the Constitution to which you saw allegiance. In the Bill of Rights, it says we are all South Africans. In the founding provisions, we are all South Africans. We have the same rights, etc., etc. It is for that reason, if only I can have a chance, I know there are people who disturb me in this way. But I appeal to you, Madam Speaker, if I may have a say. Please, just proceed. The Constitution of our country says there's only one South Africa. It says there's a common citizenship. Now you started saying, and I asked you the question, we will take land from others and give it to others. Or rather, in fact, you said we'll take it from some and give it to our people. And I asked you, Mr. President, who are our people and who are not our people? Because... Let me tell you this. In the, all the years that we struggled to democratize this country, we were being taught by the leaders of our struggle that we want peace and stability in this country so that, so that we can deal. Order, honorable members. Allow honorable Likota so to finish. Those who make noise don't win an argument. I say this. The reason we wanted peace and stability was so that we can be able to deal with the intricate problems of this country. At Cordesa, now your time is over, even by a minute, a full minute. I will still talk about it. Oh, the Honorable the President, I'm sure you'll figure out which one is the question. I thank you, Madam Speaker. I ha actually haven't quite figured out which one is the question. Uh, to the extent that maybe one could have heard uh, Honorable Lekota, uh, our, our people are all South Africans. But we lay more emphasis on the people who are poor in our country, who are landless in our country. Honorable Lekota, those are the people who we are seeking, whose lives we are seeking to improve. And I would have thought that all of us, including yourself sitting here, you are here to advance the lives of our people who are poor, who are landless, who, whose lives have been so destroyed by the legacy of apartheid. Those are the people that we are talking about. 
So I don't know exactly uh, what your lack of understanding on that is all about. Thank you very much. We now come to question number three, which was posed by the Honorable Malema to the President. The Honorable the President. Uh, Honorable Speaker, according to information from the Department of Justice and Correctional Services, government has contributed 15.3 million to the personal legal costs of former President Jacob Zuma since 2006. Of this amount, approximately 7.5 million was spent on the period between 2006 and the withdrawal of the charges against the former president in 2009. An amount of 7.8 million has been spent since 2009. This stems from a request by the former president, which he made in 2006 for legal representation at state expense in respect of the criminal proceedings. The request was approved by the presidency based on advice by the state attorney's office and the Department of Justice and Constitutional Department development as it then was. The former president signed an undertaking to refund the state if he was found to have acted in his personal capacity and own interests in the commission of the offenses with which he was charged. This administration is guided by the fundamental principle that public money should not be used to cover the legal expenses of individuals on strictly personal matters and who are found to have committed criminal offenses. I thank you. The Honorable Malema. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, President. I had pressed earlier to speak about the land and uh, unfortunately I was not recognized but I'm happy that you acknowledge the good work of our mayor, Mashaba, the, <laughs> the mayor of the EFF, who's doing a wonderful job for the EFF in the uh, Joe Bergman Spalit. And uh, that these people are going to continue losing all the time when they speak against the land because they've already lost a metro because of the land. Now, Mr. President, I want to check which law were you relying on when you paid this monies? Because the law that most of your people refer to is actually not that clear as to whether the state can pay for such offenses. And since now, the president has lost the spy tapes with that agreement, are you now saying, is he going to pay from his personal uh, coffers. But also, you, the amount you are pointing at, we don't think that it includes cases like the Gandler case, cases like uh, the public protector's case, which the court was very clear that he must pay from his personal uh, pocket, and he's appealing that. So if you were to take almost all these cases that amount will not be accurate. Because in our own calculations, as we are sitting at almost 64 million, which has been paid for legal costs of the former uh, president, the delinquent himself, who you kept and is still campaigning for you, creating an impression that there are two presidents in your ruling party. So we are saying to you that you removed him because you thought this guy was not good enough. He has cost us a lot of money as the state. 
yet he's good enough to campaign for your beautiful face. Because now he's carrying your placard. You, you must be ashamed that such a person who has costed the state so much money because of personal reasons and avoiding to go to prison. He still goes around carrying your poster the same way as Gedane Matangu, walking with you. You are so proud to walk with delinquents around you and claim to be clean. Honorable President. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The, the amounts that have been collated are the amounts that the Department of Justice and Correctional Services has been able to collect up to now. Honorable Malema is quoting an amount of 64 million. I am not aware of that. We have been using the agreement, Honorable uh, Speaker and Honorable Malema, the agreement that was struck between uh, former President Jacob Zuma and the government as this instrument that has enabled the government to help pay the money on the understanding, as the agreement clearly states, that uh, the money will be paid back if he is found to have been personally uh, responsible uh, for these acts. Now, that was an agreement that was struck. Now, we also need to make a distinction between the payment, I mean, the various legal cases that have been going on to which he has appealed. He has appealed against certain cases where legal costs have been involved and uh, those need to be separated from the ones that we are talking about now. Uh, the ones that we've uh, spoken about being 15 million, having divided them into two categories. So those are the ones that we have uh, uh, deeper knowledge of and the instrument uh, which you asked, which instrument did we use? We use the agreement and uh, clearly uh, it is uh, I, will, I will need to, to, to check that more closely. Uh, I will need to do that. Uh, the, 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 this is not the first time that this has been done. It has been done before for other uh, officials. And indeed, because you see, the, the acts that uh, former President Zuma was charged with, he was charged with acts that arose as he was occupying a government position. Yes, it was. You no, know, it was not before. It was as a result of conduct, conduct that had to do with him occupying a government position. And in that regard, yes, there is a practice that those who are charged for, for activities, be they criminal or otherwise, and this, this agreement this agreement covers that. The agreement covers that. For those who are charged, the government will cover that. And when the court finally, when the court, and this is important, because our judiciary is so independent that it does, even in the end, make a determination on the payment of costs, of legal costs. So once these matters are, are finalized, the court will be able to make a determination. And in this regard, they will even have line of sight of this agreement that has been reached. And I'm sure that when they do make a determination on the basis of the outcome of the case, they will be able to determine how those legal costs should be dealt with. Right now, because the agreement is still in place, there's just no way in which we could right now say to President Zuma in violation of the agreement that was reached that he must pay the costs. And I, I know that it would be, it would be, it would be exciting on, 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 on many people's minds that he must pay back the costs, but we have to wait until that case is finalized and a determination is made by court. We did it on the base of an agreement. Thank you very much.
The Honorable no, Alberts. Speaker, speaker. No, you can't have two no, no. opportunities, Honorable My Malema. Is not answered. No, Honorable Malema, take no, your that, seat. That's where we have a problem no. because my question is not answered. No, Honorable Malema. I've written a question to the president about which policy was he Honorable following. Honorable Malema, the president, the president has to responded me. to you. No, he says to he me, you have to check. He has told you that law. he has to check on that. But this was a written question to him long before he Honorable came here. It's Malema, here. He should have checked before he comes check, here. Take now your he seat. says to me, take you will have to go and check even when I've written a question to him. What is the purpose of writing a question? Honorable Malema, take your seat. But my question is not answered, Speaker. What, what is Malema, the purpose of this exercise? Are we going back to a situation you where... You are allowed to pursue that issue outside of this sitting right where, now. Where will we I see this guy? Proceed. I can't see him anywhere. Where will we I find him? We have to proceed to Honorable I will Alberts. I in Sundays. The Honorable Alberts. Thank you, Speaker. On a point of order, Speaker. On a what, point of order. What's the point of order, Honorable like Shrimp? The Constitution and the rules of the National Assembly places an obligation on us as Parliament to hold the executive and more specifically the president accountable. We do that through oral questions and through written questions. We have written a question exactly two weeks ago. How, 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 how does it come about that, that a president comes here without an answer about giving us legal reference because all money of the state has to be spent according to law? Why, 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 is, why are we not given the answer as to what is the legal basis of taking money of the state what is the legal basis of the agreement of taking money of the state and give to a constitutional delinquent who, 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 who has been uh, wasting our time going to court after court? Because if we do not deal with that decisively, it means someone else is going to do it. How many public representatives are there? There are many MECs in South Africa. Like, because when, when Jacob Zuma did these things, he was an MEC in KwaZulu Natal. When he was accused of corruption with the sheikhs, he was an MEC in KwaZulu Natal. So are you saying that all the MECs, all the MMCs, all the ministers must come and queue Honorable for Shibangu, legal calls from the state? Please. What law is establishing the giving of money to Jacob Zoom? The president has now responded, and you are not satisfied with his response. He has said he will check on that. You are complaining. We cannot dwell much longer on this back and forth between you and your dissatisfaction and the president. It can be pursued outside of this sitting. Can only be pursued outside of this sitting, and I'm not allowing that the time of this sitting must be further wasted on this matter. The Honorable the President. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker, yes, the, the, question, uh, the question said and I'd like to, to, to deal with that. The question did say, uh, what is the total amount that president, the presidency spent on the legal costs of former president Jacob Zuma since his election as president? And on what legal provision or policy did the state rely when using state resources to fund former president? Now, that is a legitimate question. And what I did answer, what I did answer was we focused, Honorable Malema, we focused on the agreement. And I'd like you to accept that having had an agreement that was signed in constructing our answer, we focused on the agreement and did not go further to look at the legal provision or the policy. And that is why I said, if you listen carefully, what I said was, we will look into that. And I can give you an undertaking that we will come back to you on that. Having found the agreement, we immediately thought that will give you an answer that would be satisfactory in the circumstances. Clearly, you are not satisfied with that answer because you want us to go further and look at the legal provision or the policy, which we shall do and, and come back to you. So, 
uh, we will be able to do so within a week. Thank you very much. That is being Honor presidential. Honorable President. Presidential. The Honorable President, uh, I, uh, we are actually at the point of recognizing Honorable Alberts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Achtbare president, u praat van een ooreenkomst rondom die kostes en ons weet dat papier en contracten geduldig is en dit verbreek kan word. Ons sien hoe die contract wat gemaakt is in 94 stelselmatig nou gebreek word met die gepoogde veranderingen met die grondwet. So dat is geen waarborgen voor ons wat daaruit voortspreid neem. En ek wil vir die vraag rondom die contract wat die, die ooreenkomst met die vorige president is daar enige gewaarborgen in, wat zal verseker dat hij wel betaal en die naar zijn hoofdzaken verloor. Met andere woorden, is daar securiteit gesteld van een of ander aard? En is bijvoorbeeld een kandla opgegeven als securiteit, indien hij niet zelf kan betalen? Nie. Want in de einde van die dag, als hij die geld deed niet, dan gaan die geld maar niet blij, een schuld waar die belastingbetaler moet bij betaal. Zo so ons wil graag van die weet, wat zijn securiteit is daar? Dat hij het uiteindelijk uit zijn eigen zak uit die kosten zal betalen wanneer hij verloor, want ons denkt niet, hij heeft de kans in die toekomst om enigszins te winnen. Dank je. De honorable president. Uh, we entered this agreement in good faith with former president Jacob Zuma, with the understanding that uh, as he contracts with the state uh, with regard to the payment of legal costs in case he loses the case, he would be willing, able to pay back uh, the money. And of course, of course, if that fails, the government has other legal means through which it can uh, go and recover the money. Now, we did not sign a guarantee, nor did we go to an extent of saying, give us this property, be it whichever property, we, d we did not go to that extent. And obviously we, we enter such agreements as government from time to time with various parties uh, that you know, they make undertakings and we are able to rely on those undertakings without necessarily asking for a guarantee that if the money is not paid, we obviously as the state, we have other means of recovering the money. So we should be able to do precisely that if uh, uh, the, 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 the money is not paid back at the time when it would, if the court decides in other ways. Thank you very much. The Honorable Singh. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Honorable President, thank you very much for your responses. Honorable President, the case of uh, the challenge uh, of the public protector's report has been mentioned by Honorable Malema. And we know exactly what the North Kauteng High Court had to say. In fact, uh, Justice uh, Mlambo had to say that the former president had abused the judicial process and he ordered him to pay. Now we hear, Honorable President, that you say that the matter is on appeal. I want to know who is paying the cost for this appeal. In the case, Sean Abraham's case, the presidency and through you saw fit to withdraw the appeal on the Sean Abraham's case. Is it not wise to advise former President Zuma that he should withdraw his appeal cut our losses short, and may he, uh, may, and he make him pay back the six million rand odd of state uh, taxpayers' money that has been spent on this case so far. Thank you. Honorable President. Well, it's, as I understand it, Honorable Speaker, it is advice that is being offered to us that we should have a discussion with uh, former President uh, Jacob Zuma about this matter that we should withdraw the appeal, and I can say we hear you, and thank you very much for the proposal you put forward. There are many other pro such proposals that we deal with, and thank you very much. The Honorable Maimane. Thank you, Mr. President. I mean, I think firstly, it bears noting that in a criminal case, there can be no determination of a cost order. And therefore, I struggle to understand on the basis of what law, what policy, is the former president obligated to pay back? 
I think it's important for me to also highlight the fact that we are now discussing a pensioner, somebody who is old, who one day, if he carries on with this case and you are saying you are bound by an agreement, could drag this case on for years and the taxpayer has to pay. The poor South Africans that you are saying, here's 1% VAT, let's add more to your life, they must keep financing Mr. Zuma's legal fees. So I'm here to ask you, can you not commit today to say, let us stop it now, and will you join our court action to say, let us re let's get back the money? Otherwise, this policy is illegal and invalid. Let's stop it now, and I'm asking for your commitment to say, stop funding a delinquent litigator's legal fees from henceforth. Stop it now. The Honorable the President. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I have already said that an agreement was entered into between uh, President Zuma and ourselves. And uh, that agreement is a signed agreement. I have a copy of it here. And we are obviously, as honorable people, bound by agreements that we enter into. And this agreement still stands. And our Department of Justice and Correctional Services is keeping an eye on this agreement and the various cases as they proceed. So we will keep our eye on, this on, on, on the processes of the case. And that's all I can say. And uh, uh, the agreement is here for all to see if you want to. Thank you very much. We now come to question number four, asked by the Honorable Luzi Po. Honorable the President. Honorable Speaker, as I indicated in the State of the Nation address, there is massive potential for South Africa's mining industry to grow. In fact, I look at the mining industry as a sunrise industry. It is an industry that can continue to create jobs, to stimulate industrial activity, and also to promote social development in our country. Though mining's contribution to the national GDP has fallen from 21% in 1970 to 7% to in 2016, it still represents almost 60% of our country's exports. Over the course of the next few months, Government will be engaging with stakeholders in the mining industry to develop a new mining charter for South Africa. This follows agreement between government, the industry, and other stakeholders to suspend legal action pending further consultation on the charter. This needs to form part of a broader undertaking by all social partners to ensure that mining is indeed a sunrise industry that benefits all. Our Minister of uh, Mineral Resources will be holding discussions and consultations in the coming days because he too believes that mining needs to in particular contribute to the growth of our economy. It needs to fundamentally change the living conditions of those who are affected and to ensure that they are active participants in the process of transformation. The charter should be guided by the following broad principles. The fundamental transformation of the ownership and management of the mining industry is necessary, not only to promote equity, but also to enable the industry to develop in a sustainable and much more importantly in an exclusive manner. While some progress has been made, there is a need to accelerate the transfer of ownership of the industry to black South Africans, but more especially to women. It is necessary to, ag to agree on an ambitious ownership target that can progressively and be sustainably realized. Mine workers need to have a greater role in decision making and they should be assisted in acquiring equity stakes in mining companies. 
The interests of affected communities need to be prioritized as we ensure that they are able to benefit in a meaningful way from mining operations on their land. The South African mining industry needs to be attractive to investors through a mining charter that offers certainty, a mining charter that offers stability and has a clear transformational path. The charter should have specific provisions to ensure job creation, but the charter should also speak and address the issue of beneficiation. Mines usually procure goods and services in quite a big way. There should be transformation in the, trans uh, the procurement processes of the mines. Local procurement must be part of what the mining industry does on its transformational path. Employment equity is another important challenge that the mining industry needs to address. It should promote skills development, technological innovation, and also exploration. While mining has been a mainstay of our economy, it has a history of inequity as well as ex exploitation. Through the mining charter, all role players have an opportunity to chart what I would call a new path of growth, a path of development, transformation, and inclusive prosperity. This is an industry that we need to pay more attention to as a country because it has for a very long time been the bedrock of our economic growth trajectory. And we can use mining once again as a growth industry and we can use it once again as a great job creator because underneath the soil of our country lies minerals that are waiting to be exploited. But this time round, we are saying, as they get exploited, it must be to the benefit of our people and not just to the benefit of a few people who might be all over the world. So we therefore are saying the mining charter is being addressed as we speak now, and we believe that an agreement will be reached and an agreement that will lead to the benefit of the industry as a whole, as well as all the stakeholders who are part and parcel of this industry in the form of workers, investors, communities, government as well, and a number of other people who are part of making sure that our industry grows. Thank you very much. The Honorable Luz Zipo. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, President. One of the key challenges in the mining charter is the issue of the absence of an assessment tool and assessment mechanism based on the cycle that uh, is subjected to by review, but also the internal capacity of the department in terms of monitoring and ensure that there is compliance. And therefore this at the end of the negotiations can become the point of dispute. Therefore the question is, what measures will the government put in place to ensure that the DMR as a custodian for the implementation of those decisions is able to properly administer and monitor implementation of the new mining charter so that it has an impact on transformation in the mining industry as intended by parliament when it passed the MPRDA in 2002. Thank you very much. The Honorable the President. Honorable Speaker, the new Minister of Mineral Resources, Minister Mantashe, has hit the ground running. He has already <laughs> he has already made it his task not only to meet the various people in his department, but he has already been to the various trouble spots of the mining industry. He has been to mines where workers have been undergoing or going through a number of difficulties. 
You should all have seen him as he went to mines like Optimum to go and engage with the mining managers about the challenges that the mines are facing. But at the same time, he has already made it his job to go around the country, which he's going to speed up on to visit uh, DMR offices. Having started at headquarters level, he is now going to be going around the country to where the DMR offices are with a view of determining what the capacity of DMR is, whether DMR is well placed to oversee mining in our country, to do the necessary assessments that you're talking about, not only to see to whether the laws that we have passed are being implemented, but also to look at how safety standards are being adhered to. So we have here a minister who knows the industry, a minister who has worked in the industry, a minister who understands miners, a minister who worked underground, and who knows what the underground workings of a mine look like, and he does not rely on hearsay. And I would say, let's give him an opportunity to go uh, throughout the length and the breadth of the country to engage with the various managers, various officials, and be able to determine precisely what needs to be done in the industry and the assessment tools that he will need to have. This weekend, he's spending time with all those who are in the industry who are supposed to uh, have a dialogue with him on the mining charter. We hope that the three-month period that he has set for himself will yield finally a mining charter for our country. And during the course of doing all this, he'll be spending a lot of time engaging with these officials to make sure that the mining industry returns to a place of pride for our country where we will know that we are able to generate growth out of this industry. Thank you very much. The Honorable Josie. Thank you, uh, Speaker. You know, all workers would like to be like Utati Mkwati, get out, get educational opportunities so that they themselves are educated like him. But the problem is the mining charter is not enforceable. There are no consequences when people or these companies that are in either way involved in aggressive tax avoidance and illicit financial flows, when they don't meet the targets, there are no consequences, there is no punishment. So if they don't give community opportunities, if they don't improve housing, if they don't give workers skills, there are no punishment. Would you consider nationalization of mines that don't meet the targets taking into consideration the important objectives of transformation on one hand, and the other, the fact that has been properly demonstrated by even the former President Abumbeki, that they are engaged in aggressive tax avoidance. Shouldn't one of the mechanisms to make them comply, the fact that if they don't, we are going to expropriate them without compensation? The Honorable the President. Thank you. It could be quite tempting to think that uh, companies that seem to make a lot of profit could be nationalized. And by nationalizing them, you then increase the coffers of the state. But what comes with that, Honorable Ndlozi, is also the burden of having to capitalize those companies. Because you can go and take a mining company that is worth, say, 100 billion rand, and it could yield profits for a year or two, then because it is subject to commodities, the commodities tank, and then you have to put more money in, and that money, if we have nationalized it, will have to come from the fiscus. 
because there is this thing that is called right offers. They can come to the company as managers and say, we need to go and exploit a particular ore body and need to sink a shaft, and it's going to cost us 20 billion rand. You are a shareholder. We require that you should follow your rights and give us so much money so that we can go and explore there. Now, the risks and the dangers that lie in store is something that one needs to examine very carefully. Because it is all very well to say, go and nationalize. And sometimes you can be nationalizing. One, mining is a wasting asset. You could be pouring your money down a drain. And quite often, in, in my view, sometimes it's better to rely on people who have a huge appetite for risk now, I would need to ask myself, do we have, as a nation, an appetite for risk to be able to go and pour billions of money into holes in the ground and sometimes don't find the ore body that we want? And sometimes the commodity pricing keeps going up and down. And then sometimes there are, de there are years of drought and there are years of boom. Because mining in the end, in the most part, is bust and boom. You could go bust, you could also have great years of boom. Is that what we want to subject our type of uh, state to, which is a developmental state, to processes like that? Are there other industries that would be better placed to be able to yield better? You may find that you know, shareholders would say, yes, come and nationalize. Even if it is without compensation, take the burden out of our hands. Because quite often, I mean, those who are involved in the mining industry will tell you that acid is a wasting asset. It's an asset from day one, you're just going down. And you may just benefit for a short while. And is that what we would want to expose our general fiscus to? So, yes, 50 years of bust and boom. Bust and boom, Honorable Ndozi. So would, would we consider that? I would be welcome for you to engage in research and assessment, and assessment, but also to also rely on the knowledge of people who have experienced it. Go and sit down and talk to Honorable Mantash who has, been a, who has been in the mining industry, and he will tell you what mining is all about. Mining is an industry that's not for sissies. Thank you very much. The Honorable Lorima. Mr. President, the mining charter is designed to be changed every five years. How is that compatible with a certain and predictable mining regulatory system that we need if we want to get investment? The Honorable the President. Clearly every investor wants certainty on a sustainable basis. Every investor wants to know that the rules of the game are not going to change every now and then. And the mining charter that we are going to finalize should be the type of mining charter that will stand us in good stead for many years to come. Because otherwise it will be very difficult for us to attract investors and to ask people to commit their money for 20 years and more. And in some instances to commit to money for a fairly long time before dividends are yielded. I know of situations where people have invested in mining projects for almost 20 years before any ore comes out of the ground because mining by its very nature, it's a long-term project or process. It's not a process where you can dig up a hole and, find, and think that you will find the, the minerals that you want, process them, and then sell them immediately. So I would say that the mining charter that we are going to strike should be the type of mining charter that will stand us in good stead for a number of years to come. But the real issue here is going to be whether the partners who strike or arrive at this mining charter 
are going to be willing to implement the mining charter. As I understand it, we've reached this stage of an amendment uh, of this charter because the parties that were part of this agreement did not implement their side of the bargain. And if we can have a mining charter with partners who are going to implement their side of the bargain, there should be no need at all to be amending the mining charter every five years. Thank you very much. The Honorable Kubisa. What would you say are the challenge, have been the challenges and impediments to ensure that they are represented by way of owning the mines and also making sure that they also become businesses in that regard? What has been the problems in that regard? Sure, thank you. The Honorable the President. Part of the structure of our mining, ch mining industry has been uh, the legacy that it has had from the past, which is apartheid, where apartheid con colonialism, when it came to mining, made sure that the ore body was found, they imported workers from all over the country, and those workers became migrant workers. And that led to a complete disregard of people who lived near the mines. They did not become part of the labor pool that could be trained and relied on, and the communities around the mines were completely disregarded. They were not seen as a resource or as partners to the mining effort. What the mining charter is seeking to do now is to change all that. And this is part of the whole transformation process to make all the key role players partners in mining, in an endeavor, uh, on a mind-to-mind -mind basis, no doubt, that is going to lead to the benefit of all. So in the end, we will have, yes, women, young people, and our ordinary people in the surrounding areas being part and parcel of the, either the labor pool, the business pool, and uh, various uh, beneficiaries that can be part of uh, the area where mining takes place. And to this end, we are saying procurement must take place. Quite a lot of procurement we want it to be localized. We want the mines themselves to lead business entrepreneurship in the area, to develop skills so that everyone who is near and uh, lives near a mine must feel that it is an asset that they can all benefit from. Because after all, most of these mines are planted in areas uh, that are either controlled or owned by our people as a whole. Uh, from a historical point of view, they should therefore benefit. So the charter that we are drafting now is going to be addressing itself precisely to that through various mechanisms that we will put in place. Thank you very much. We now come to question number five, asked by the Honorable Klengwa of the IFP, the Honorable the President. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The institution of traditional leadership is a fundamental part of South Africa's constitutional democracy. As I said during the opening of the House of Traditional Leaders the other day, we will continue to ensure that our constitution and the laws passed by our people remain effective in supporting and adopting this institution to better serve our citizens. In the years since cabinet committees recommended in 2000, government has worked with traditional leaders to develop a common approach to the powers, the role and functions of traditional leadership. This was one of the matters covered at the indigenous and traditional leadership in Daba, which was held in 2017. 
and during the debate of the opening of the National House of Traditional Leaders. The Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Dr. Zuelim Kize, will develop a detailed plan on how we are going to address the issues raised during the debate that ensued, but he's also going to be developing a plan which is based on the declaration that was passed or adopted at the Indaba that was held in 2017. We are committed to ongoing engagement on the legislative framework on traditional leadership, not only with traditional leaders, but also with affected communities as well as other stakeholders. I'm confident that the concerns of traditional leaders can be addressed without the need for a constitutional amendment. What we structured into our constitution is quite forward looking in terms of defining the role of traditional leadership. The role of traditional leadership is secured in terms of our constitution, and indeed, traditional leaders are a strong part of the body politic of our country, and our task is going to be to continue to strength, strengthen that institution and give it as much support as we possibly can so that it can grow and develop and be part of the discourse on many issues that Okay, in our country. Thank you. The Honorable Shengwa. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Mr. President, it's a case of deja vu already. We have been down this road before of commitments, and commitments which have materialized to naught piecemeal legislation over time which has not addressed the issues. You will also recall, Mr. President, that when you, in fact, had the drawing up of the constitution of this country, these concerns were raised. The, the issue of international mediation was torpedoed and amounted to naught. And so 18 years later, you take us back down to square one to say there will be ongoing engagement. The question then becomes, Mr. President, one, what confidence can traditional leaders have in terms of the clarity that they require? Because the wall-to-wall -wall municipal boundaries <coughs> have caused a duplication of authority in many areas in this country and is causing a problem. The interventions of Section 81 have not assisted. So what changes now? What guarantees can you give now that what all that you say, you know, that has been said, is going to be brought to a logical conclusion and actually define the powers, the role and functions of traditional leaders, what shape or form will those take? Because we can't be having the same discussions over and over and over again, whereas the issues are actually very clear and on the table. And now, yet again, we come with another commitment. For how long must traditional leaders endure this kind of treatment at the hands of the state, whereas they've actually done nothing wrong but seek to be part and parcel of the body politic and development of this country. So, Mr. President, we need to bring this to a logical conclusion. Thank you, House Chair. Oh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I had a wonderful exchange with traditional leaders when they invited me to open the National House of Traditional Leaders. And they also allowed me to respond uh, to the issues that they raised. The engagement, I believe, was fruitful. It was uh, quite uh, an engaging type of process where they were raising issues which I had time and occasion to respond to. Our new Minister of Cooperative Governance was also in the House 
and listened very carefully to the issues that were being raised by traditional leaders. And the advantage of his presence is that he participated in the Indaba that was held last year in 2017. He was, if you like, an active participant and he is fully aware of the declaration that was drafted. Now, that Indaba dealt, Honorable Klangwa, with a lot of the issues that were also ventilated during the debate in the National House of Traditional Leaders. And we overlaid what we had to say in that house with a very clear commitment that the minister is going to be one, continuing the engagement, but two, identifying issues that we are going to start acting on. And he is going to be coming forward to the presidency to raise various matters that need to be addressed. And some of them are not easy, they are quite difficult matters, but we've made a commitment that we are going to address all the matters they have raised. You raised the issue of the interface between traditional leaders and uh, our municipal representatives. In a number of areas, it is working well. In some cases, it isn't. And that's one of the issues that we are going to have to address. And the various other matters that were raised, we thought we would be able to find fairly workable solutions around. So rather than you say that nothing is going to come out of this process, I would say we've now arrived at a particular moment where we think that the solutions that we have always sought with regard to addressing the challenges that traditional leaders are going to be coming forth and we will be able to address their concerns. So I have no doubt in my mind that difficult as some of the issues are, we will find solutions and you will have noticed that from the governing party side, we are continuing to engage at close range with traditional leaders, with our kings and queens and various other levels of traditional leaders because we believe as government that the role that traditional leaders have to play in the life of our country and indeed in the life of our people is very important. And we will continue and I repeat what I said in that house since you raised the word respect. We will continue to treat them with the respect that they deserve because they are the natural leaders of our people. We will continue to engage with them with respect and due recognition because they have a huge role to play in the lives of our people, particularly people who live in rural areas. So our engagement is not enforced. It is uh, easy engagement, and we will make sure that we do find solutions to difficult issues. Sometimes we will not be able to find solutions, and we, will, we have undertaken and promised each other that the engagement will continue. What I found is that there was a great deal of confidence, confidence in what we outlined to them and they are looking forward to engaging with us. So a season of engagement with traditional leaders is going to be ongoing and we will make sure that we do so with a great deal of commitment. Our minister is going to be continuing with that process. Thank you very much. Honorable Mailham. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Mr. President, the report of the high-level panel on the assessment of key legislation issued by President Kalema Motlante addresses a number of challenges around the traditional and Khoisan leadership bill. It notes that the proposed legislation denies people living in areas under traditional leaders several constitutional rights, distinguishing them from those living in the rest of the country who enjoy the full benefits of post-apartheid citizenship, and that it poses a threat to social cohesion by entrenching and promoting ethnic identities. These mirror many of the objections raised by the DA when this bill was debated in the House. The panel proposed that Parliament should withdraw the traditional and Khoisan leadership bill in its entirety, or 
it should reconsider those provisions that may elicit constitutional challenges and undermine social cohesion and nation building, and replace the bill with inclusive legislation that recognizes the Khoi and San. Since this bill is intended to be the primary legislation governing and defining the roles and responsibilities Your of traditional and Khoisan leaders, will you consider referring it back to the National Assembly, and if not, why not? Please keep to your time, Honorable President. Thank you, thank you. The, the bill that has been put forward uh, is a bill that we also had time to also discuss uh, quite briefly, I must admit, with uh, a number of the traditional leaders who are part of the National Traditional uh, Leaders House. And we did not find a lot of opposition to the bill being put forward and taken forward. And indeed, we also found that even the traditional leaders who are part of the Khoisan community themselves did not have any great difficulty. Now, we have noted what uh, the, uh, the, the panel has said, and we've, we will take that to heart. Uh, one of the reasons why the panel was set up was precisely to identify areas that, and laws that we need to have a re-look on, and we will do precisely that. But as regards the response from a number of participants at the House of Traditional Leaders, we did not pick up any of the problems that you're alluding to, but at the same time, we will keep that in mind, and uh, in the course of discussing all this, we will make sure that every view is heard and every suggestion is taken on board. Thank you very much. Honorable Holomisa. Silalo Nawe Mongame. Uko umpa wen funu patla wona lembia makosi. Apa ukulmende wenza i commission on traditional leadership claims and disputes. Jengo mdo figa yogle office. Banisi abantu abangamakosi abalindele ukusaini lose big gate in terms of the recommendations by this commission. Why unga ke usege i team as our seven salad be clearing house i kuchule yonga lendo ngoba amakosa mani sabi kuchigelezen. Asuwe buz balaza findings the commission. The implement one in, uye mampondu in, uye kuintlangu in, lebe ndiku yabe msugu in, kubale nengwa atubaka kuicho. So as was do as I think Gaganis clearly shingo kaulesa inga kumbi njeba kuzawa ya kutetua bomshab. Gos. President. And Gos, thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, Honorable Holomisa, u minister lo asimege gule slal. Uh, Iyo na enye yezi ndo azo ichonga gele. Uh, umsebe nzi because as we go around, indeed you are right, we are meeting quite a number of traditional leaders who through various commissions, from the Ntlapo Commission and a number of others, had hoped that their own status will be resolved. And they had hoped that uh, the president will give them their certificates of uh, recognition and in a number of cases, that has not happened. Our Minister of uh, uh, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Leadership is going to be seized with particularly this matter, and in fact, is top of his agenda as he starts his work. Thank you very much. Honorable Masonde. Um, Deputy Speaker and members, Mungami, ngezo lot wasi parliament si afumela nguti ntu tu bon gumbela pambi, inje bon lega kulu si afambi. Ukona kuxa moyana, oxope uktu ngamans, nokchalo mukuba unga bambisa ni pato gakulmeni na makos, loku gesti agweshwam. Mr. President. At the opening of the National House of Tradition, Traditional Leaders, 
you committed, amongst others, to catapulting agriculture to a high, high level. You urged, amongst others, for a rural and an ag agricultural revolution. How will this come to fruition without a meaningful collaboration between Makosi and government? Please elaborate. Mr. President. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you very much, Honorable Masondo. One of the highlights of the engagement that we had with the, uh, the traditional leaders during that debate was the enthusiastic anticipation they have on looking at agriculture as a growth industry and how they committed themselves to utilizing the land that they have as a key driver of, of uh, economic growth, but also as a key driver in terms of bringing in young people into agriculture and getting them and interesting them in participating very actively in agriculture. They decried the process that is underway now where young people leave the rural areas and throng into cities, and they said, if they can be given the support and the assistance that is necessary for them to turn agriculture around, they will be able to generate quite a lot of growth or the areas where they are will be able to generate a lot of growth. And they ask for simple things. Simple things such as could government focus more on agriculture development in the areas where they are could government give them support when it, came, when it comes to things such as implements for farming, things like seed and uh, fertilizer? And they said, if we could just help them with that in the terms of the various schemes that are out there, they will be able to see success. But I also heard them say they are grateful that a number of projects that we have embarked upon are yielding good results, particularly the agri-parks. They spoke glowingly about a number of agri-parks that are in their areas, which they saw beginning to lead them to agri-processing. And that, for me, was quite pleasing to hear traditional leaders looking forward to growth being generated in agriculture and uh, contributing to the growth of our economy. So we will want to support young people. We will want to set up a number of programs. And some of these will obviously be done through the various uh, interventions that we already have, such as the public employment projects that we have already started on. And some of these will be generated through the various programs that the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries is in, involved in. And indeed, many other of our government departments uh, will be able to lend a hand with this. So what we can look forward to, Honorable Masondo, is the active participation of traditional leaders in agricultural development. Look forward to how they can participate in agro-processing going forward. And as government, we will be seeking to give them the tools, the means, and the op open opportunities for them to be able to participate. Now that we have arrived at a point where we are going to unlock the wealth, the capabilities in land, we believe that we will be able to see many traditional leaders and indeed our people in the areas where they are participating very vigorously and actively in agriculture, and to see agriculture playing a key role in the growth of our economy, as it has done in the last two to three quarters uh, in our economic growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question to you, Mr. President, is from Honorable Kubisa. Honorable members, the public confidence in institutions like the National Prosecuting Authority 
is critical if we are to build a better, prosperous, and more equitable society. That is why in the State of the Nation Address, we prioritized the restoration of the stability and integrity of the National Prosecuting Agency or Authority. The matter of the position of the National Director of Public Prosecutions is currently before the courts. We will continue to do what we can to ensure that the matter is speedily resolved in the interests of justice, the rule of law, as well as fairness. We all have a responsibility as political leaders to ensure that the NPA is able to undertake its mandate without any fear or favor. The NPA must work in a way where it serves the interests of all our people by being efficient, effective, and promoting the rule of law in South Africa. This, honorable deputy chair, uh, speaker rather, it must do without any fear, it must do without any favor or any prejudice. In terms of both the Constitution and the NPA Act, the President has clearly defined obligations in relation to the NPA. In performing these obligations, including the appointment of the NDPP and other directors of public prosecutions, I will ensure the adherence both to the spirit as well as to the statutory requirements and jurisprudence emanating from our courts in relation to these matters. There are good women and men in the National Prosecuting Authority. There are a number of people who are in the NPA who are people of integrity, people who have experience, and people who have specialist knowledge about their craft. With effective leadership, with a more stable institutional environment, and with our support as leaders, I am certain that they will be able, once again, to undertake their important responsibilities with purpose, as well as with distinction. I thank you. Honorable Kubisa. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Honorable President, in your answer, you allude to the fact that uh, the image that has been portrayed by the NPA has not been enviable. And this has happened for quite a number of years. Uh, the answers to your chief among them has been the issues of <coughs> administration, internal squabbles, uh, errors of judgment, and a, a plethora of other issues. Now, Honorable President, have you had any time to sit down with the, the minister in charge just to pave a way forward with regard to these matters that are so crucial for the NPA? Thank you very much. Honorable President. Yes, I have had the opportunity to have a discussion with the Minister uh, of uh, Justice and correctional development matters, services, and we have in our discussion looked at the issue of the NPA and how best we can uh, ensure that the confidence of our people in the NPA is increased. We must admit that uh, over some time, the confidence of our people in the NPA has actually gone down. And uh, we are now discussing precisely the issue of the NPA. And as I said in my answer, the issue of the director of the NPA is before the courts. And we must allow our courts to process that matter. And once they have finished that matter, we will then be able to know the way we should chart forward with regard to the NPA. Thank you very much. Honorable Menten. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. 
Mr. President, the reason why the NPA is where it is now, right now is the source of corruption, nepotism, and issuing of unlawful instructions by the executive. So what have you done right now in terms of ESCOM appointing Mr. Debengwa, who was the main man behind your campaign and your close friend? Well, what happened to SAA, the appointment of Ms. Dudumieni as the closest friend of Mr. Zuma, is the very same situation that the NPA is in right now. So with you appointing Mr. Debengwa, are you not encouraging the very same thing Honorable that member, it must continue in the country because the state-owned entities are the very same thing as the NPA? Honorable President. Thank you, Madam uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm, I'm required to answer directly, you say, the issue of Mr. Dabengwa. Mr. Dabengwa is an executive that I have known for a long time. He used to be an executive at ESCOM, and then he left, and he went to be an ex executive at uh, MTN, and he then became the chief executive officer of MTN. Uh, very, very astute and well-experienced person that I know. When the name of uh, Mr. Dabengo was brought to be appointed as a director, I immediately said, I know him and I'd like to recuse myself from being part of the decision that will lead to the appointment of Mr. Dabemba. I decided, and I think I'd like you to understand this, I decided that uh, I should recuse myself to avoid and not hide the fact that I know him, to avoid a situation where I could be accused of a conflictual relationship. I do not have any ongoing relationship of whatever nature with Mr. Dabengwa, except for the fact that I know him, and knowing him as well as a person who uh, I was chairman of at ESCO, no, no, at uh, MTN. Beyond that, beyond that, I am not involved with Mr. Dabengwa in any manner whatsoever. And in <laughs> no weddings and dinners. <laughs> now, I, I had the antenna in my head told me that. One, you've got to declare that you know him and recuse yourself. And get people who might want to decide on him to know that one, you've recused yourself and you do not want to get involved in any way, shape, or whatever. Now, it often happens that when uh, we have to appoint people, we either know them in one way or another. And maybe you've been to university with them, uh, that you've met them along the road, and and uh, when it comes to a conflictual relationship, it needs to be determined whether his activities, wherever he's deployed, are going to be of such a fraudulent nature that they will be geared towards advancing your position. Now, I can say with certainty, Mr. Dabengwa's role and participation in ESCOM is not going to be of a fraudulent nature advancing my interests. That will not happen. 
under any circumstance. Now, I know that we become fearful because of experiences that we have had in the past. Yes, and I can give you assurance, an assurance that that is not going to happen with me. And thank you very much. Honorable Milder. Honorable President, in the State of the Nation Address, as well as in your original answer today, you conceded that we need to restore the credibility of the prosecuting authority. And you said that we need to bring stability there and that confidence in that institution is critical. And because of that, you've indicated that you, as a new president, what you will do in that process. You also indicated that you've already spoken to the minister. But, Honorable President, if you look at the Constitution, Section 179, that deals with the NPA, it clearly states in Section 179.5 that the National Director of Public Prosecutions must determine with the concurrence of the cabinet member responsible for the administration of justice, prosecution policy. And then it goes on in subsection 6. The cabinet member responsible for the administration of justice must exercise final responsibility over the prosecuting authority. Not only the director, the minister must take the final responsibility. Now you have reappointed the Honorable Masuta who has been in that position for the last four years already. What I want to ask you is when you consider your next cabinet reshuffle, take this into account. Thank you. Honorable President. Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, I guess in everything that one does, one will always seek to take into account the constitutional provisions that should be guiding our work. And we will seek to lay emphasis on acting correctly in terms of the law and in terms of the Constitution. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Honorable members, that concludes the business of the day. Uh, oh, Honorable Tlo Ama, I have nothing against you, sir. Please go ahead. Nothing against you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Before I ask this follow-up question, Honorable President, when are you going to do a morning walk with the widows of Americana and ask them if they are coping since they are... <laughs> Honorable, Pres Honorable President, <clears throat> Mr. Sean Abrams has become a symbol of a dis dysfunctional N NPA. He has forfeited the independence of the institution to factional battles of the ruling party. Can't he step aside to allow someone incorruptible and trustworthy to ensure the recovery of trust of this institution? I think. Mr. President. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. It seems like Honorable Kiwama is addressing his question to Mr. Sean Abrams and not to me, because he says, can't he step aside? So I don't know what the question is. All I can say is that we are dealing with the matter of the uh, National Prosecuting Authority, and in dealing with it, we're driven by one thing and one thing only, to ensure that we restore confidence in the NPA so that the NPA can be the institution that will continue to act in the promotion of justice in our country and fairness and ensure that it acts without any fear, favor, or prejudice uh, in whatever it does. And also without any form of interference from any one of us, that they must be an independent authority that executes the work that it, it is meant to do. Uh, Honorable Kawama, that is what we can promise you. And uh, what we have said here is what we are going to adhere to. And the minister will be dealing with this matter. 
and we are waiting obviously for the court outcome. And once the court has determined on the basis of the appeals that have been lodged, we will then be able to have greater clarity on what needs to be done in that regard. But once again, thank you for raising the matter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, for the moment that you have accorded me to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes questions to the President. Honorable members, we wish to remind you that the House begins at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Please remember that. That concludes the business of the day. The House is adjourned.